How's my body position? Do I look engaging? Hello and welcome to the opening bell, the Boxing News Podcast. My name's Matt Christie and today I'm joined by John Denon. Hello. Who, like a true soldier, has pulled himself off his deathbed and come in to do the podcast. Now, you have been struggling. You left us on press day because you were that bad. And you what must that been, You must have been ill to leave <laughs> on press day. How are you feeling today? Uh, you know, I'm coping. I'm, you know, delirious. Who knows what I'm going to say? But you know it's my duty to be here, so so I'm here. You, you sound you sound worse than you look. So is I'll, that a compliment? I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, you yeah. sound better than you look. <laughs> I always do. I always do. Um, okay, so we've got a few few bits and bobs that been going on in the boxing world that we're going to talk about. First of all, um, if we talk about some of the stuff that was on Box Nation over the weekend, we've got Marco Hook who again proved um, to be a better fighter second time round as he, um, he beat Fira Arsene, stopping him in six rounds. And their first fight in 2012 was um, a lot closer. And it's the mark of a good fight, a good fighter when, when they can do that. And he's also did it against Ola Afalabi recently, Marco Hook. And if you look at his record at Cruiserweight and what he's been doing um, as WBO champion, I know it sounds crazy, but bear in mind the Cruiserweight division is in its... In its comparative infancy um, to the other divisions. But Marco Hook is one of the all-time great <laughs> fighters in that division. It's hard to argue with you, Matt, especially <laughs> in my weakened condition. He doesn't look like an all-time great fighter. No. He's a bit rough and ready. I mean, he does. he's entertaining to watch. He does bring the heat. But, you know, David Hayes, a cruiserweight, would he beat Marco Hook? I think he would, but, he's, but his body of work, David Hayes' body of work, well, he wasn't there as long, was he? He wasn't there as long. I guess you could say that, that Hay more or less cleaned up. But um, no, I'd certainly pick David Hay over over Marco Hook. But yeah. What's next it's for Marco Hook? Because he's only 29. There was talk after some of his kind of um, mediocre performances that some of the hard battles may have taken out of him. But he looked he looked he looked decent against Arsenal. And yeah, yeah, and he really brought he sort of brought a real intensity to the way he was fighting. So it looks like there's a lot of life left in him. He's still talking about moving up to heavyweight. His one performance there against Alexander Povetkin was was fairly impressive, a lot better than most people expected. Will Hook be a worthwhile addition to the heavyweight ranks, or would you rather see him at cruiserweight? So I think, I just think to, to compete with the heavyweights, you need the dimensions, don't you? And I just don't think he's, I just don't think he's really big enough. But then I suppose with the absence of of Vitali, there are, there might be. You know, weaker, uh, check, you know, contenders for for the WBC title, yeah. for win, for instance, and so he could make entertaining fights. Um, I would think he's better off just dominating his division, trying to, you know, I think it'd be better to see him, you know, try to unify titles than um, the move, you know, than trying to become a two weight champion. Would you, do you do you put him at number one at cruiserweight, or maybe Juan Pablo Hernandez, or is there anybody else at cruiserweight that can really argue? with his cred credentials as number yeah, one. I think he's probably number one at the moment, but that doesn't mean someone like Hernandez couldn't beat him. But yeah. I think when you look at his body of work, um, that would put, you know, from what he's achieved so far, that would put him at number one. Okay, let's move on. Speaking body of work, let's move to Lamont Peterson, um, who, to be fair, looked pretty good against uh, Dieri Jean at the weekend um, to retain his IBF light welterweight title. This, of course, is the IBF light welterweight title that he won in controversial circumstances. First of all, with the close decision against Amir Khan, and then, of course, with the subsequent um, events that occurred with him. We found out that he'd failed drug tests and what have you. He also has since lost to Luc Lucas Matisse in a non-title fight which historically is not a bad thing. Champions over time have, of course, um, taken part in, in non-title fights and lost, and their title has not been affected. However, there's something about Lamont Peterson that bothers me with him being a world champion and with the whole drug testing thing. Whether or not he's got a valid excuse for the testosterone that, that, that was in his body, surely the line, the line should be drawn with the fact he failed that drug test. Is there any other sport where a, uh, someone competing at the top level would fail a drug test and then be allowed to defend their world title. I'm, and, you know, I'm trying to think, but 
Yeah, like you say, he should really have been stripped of that title. And, you know, having a non-title fight, like sneaking up to a catch weight just yeah. to not risk his title against Matisse, he was a bit cheeky as well. But yeah, it's it sort of, it reflects badly on boxing that he's still a champion. And it is, like, the Montpeterson is troubling because he was an extreme, you know, before we found out about the failed drugs test, he was, you know, an extremely appealing fighter yeah, after everything he'd yeah. been through with his in his life, he was a great boxing story. And he said himself that he stood for something after when he won the title in Washington against Khan. And that's why it's sort of doubly uh, depressing for that that that, 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 that 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 was based on what you know, what appears to be cheating. Um so there's not a you know, there's there's not a lot you, you can say really to to, to to justify or at least you know if he could have been stripped of the title maybe served out some sort of ban then you could feel like he's been punished yeah and that would be all right whereas it seems that he's sort of carried on un unaffected yeah it does yeah as i said it just doesn't seem right and, but you're exactly right with lamont peterson um he did seem like one of the games you know good guys someone to root for until all this came out and you know, for wh whatever his reasons, you do sense that he's kind of got away with this without being punished at all. Um, I know the WBA kind of stripped him of the title. The IBF chose not to for whatever reason. That makes it look even worse for, does. for him in the IBF that he's still got exactly. got one of his titles. And, and, and boxing, and boxing, and it, it really is kind of you know it's, it shows how muddled the sport can be at the very very top level as well. Um, they're talking about him fighting um, Danny Garcia who you would say is, is the division leader. Um, give him a shot of upsetting Garcia. Yeah, if we're all... We were just saying about the reasons we don't like Lamont Peterson. He's very, very good, isn't he? And yeah. he's got a lot of heart in the ring as well. I think Garcia's got to be the favourite going into that. Garcia's looked so good and beat, you know, and beat Matisse in such style. But Peterson is a really good fighter. He sort of really knows what he's doing in the ring. He, he doesn't seem... You know, he doesn't seem like he's got outstanding punch power or outstanding speed, but his timing and being good yeah. at everything be, ma makes him does make him quite formidable. And the fact, you know, we've seen him be knocked over, but he always seems to get back up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is. It's probably going to be a good fight, <laughs> sadly. Yeah, well, I won't be watching it. That's for sure. Anyway, I've okay. got stuff on. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's um, let's move on. There was there's quite a lot of um, rematches being um, rumoured, discussed and confirmed um, for the next few months. But the biggest news of a confirmation of a rematch was Timothy Bradley Manny Pacquiao, which takes place on April the 12th in Las Vegas. I'm fascinated by this one. The first one, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't a classic. It won't go down in history as a great fight, but it will go down in history as one of the most infamous stories in boxing history with what happened with that decision. Um, okay, what, what, what's going to happen in the rematch? Does Pacquiao repeat his, his perceived dominance and win the decision this time? Does he go hell for leather and knock Bradley out? Or is Bradley that much of a better fighter? Pacquiao has slipped a bit and Bradley wins deservedly this time. Or none of the above. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but... <laughs> But Bradley, he's like, cause Pacquiao seems to have lost a bit of the fire, slipped a little bit, even though he won well against Rios, he was, he's not quite the same, the same force of old. Bradley just, he's got this indomitable will to win, and he'll be so up for this as well, because, you know, because he was, you know, it wasn't his, you know, he, he didn't judge the fight, um, and he was, he really resented the sort of, um, you know, all the criticism that was heaped on him after the Pacquiao fight, yeah. after the first one. Um, so he'll be ultra, you know, he'll be ultra determined, even though he, as he always is for this. And he's very convincing as well. I think, you know, I th uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, I think it's actually a real 50 50 fight. Bradley, there was a great win over Marquez, showed how technically excellent he was from the Provonica fight. We know that he's, you know, he's at heart a fighter and he's got a lot of bottle. But then, you know, the, their first fight would say that Pacquiao's a little bit better. So maybe Pacquiao can get the, the points win he should have got the first time. But I, you know, it's very easy to see, to see. 
Bradley just not allowing himself to lose. It's true. It's it's it's, it's really really tough one to call, isn't it? Is there, is there, do you think with with, with Pacquiao now considering? how frustrated he was with the decision the first time around, not wanting to leave it into the judges' hands. Uh, what are the chances of, and, and particularly bear in mind as well, the, the, the problems that Bradley had with um, Provodnikov. He's been dropped a few times. He was dropped um, against Kendall Holt, who was in trouble early in that fight. What are the chances of Pacquiao walking out, like the Pacquiao of old, and steamrolling through Timothy Bradley in three or four rounds? I, th I mean, I think that scenario is pretty unlikely because it's, you know, Pacquiao didn't, he hasn't seemed to have that ruthless, destructive mm. instincts that, that that he did a few years ago. Um, and Bradley's, you know, Bradley's a tough guy. I don't think he's going to let himself, you know, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to lie down easily. And, you know, Mark, you know, and you know defensively he's quite good too he's not he's not going to sort of walk onto anything recklessly um so i th i don't think he's going to get taken out early but i've been wrong many times haven't we all haven't we all something else interesting with this fight as well for me is that is that bradley has kind of edged himself into the top 3 or 4 pound for pound over the last 2 years really um pacquiao has slipped out of that but the winner of this fight, you could make a case for then jumping all the way up to number two, couldn't you? To be behind Mayweather. Do you think that's fair, or do you think Andre Ward keeps that mythical, that mythical runners-up slot? Pro I think Andre Ward probably does stay up there. Just you know, he's been, he's just looked, you know, not untouch. No one's untouchable, but I think the, the way you're looking at it is, is, is there anyone out there who can be him? Andre Ward is looking pretty close to unbeatable, whereas. You know, Bradley's been he's been hurt or been lucky with a decision, even though he sort of finds a way to win. I think in our fevered imaginations and pound for pound <laughs> lists, that might count against him. Because yeah. he still he still has the sort of you know, even though he's right up there, he still has the sort of aura of an underdog. Yeah. You know, you know a, yeah, a yeah. scrappy underdog, yeah, but definitely. an underdog nevertheless. Definitely. And I mean something else, and I know this you know, this has been discussed too many times. I'm probably the most guilty of it in the Boxing News office. But also, the winner of Bradley Pacquiao is surely, surely, surely puts himself forward to be the most deserving of a fight against Floyd Mayweather, right? Yeah, but, you know, Bradley's locked in with top rank now, so that's just... It's a shame, it's just, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's silly, isn't it? You talk about other sports. Yeah. You know, the, the two the two outstanding boxers in any weight division should fight each other for the title, but... Yeah. We've sort of got used to the reality of top rank fighters aren't boxing Floyd Mayweather anytime soon. Sorry, mate. Don't like it. Don't like it. But no, you are absolutely right, I fear. Moving on, the other, I think we spoke about this last week, was um, the whole situation with Carl Frotch, George Groves, and the third man now, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Um, this week is something else that kind of. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. has been made by the WBC, and we'll talk about WBC actually, has been made mandatory by the WBC at super middleweight. He hasn't had a single fight at super middleweight. What's all that about? It doesn't make any sense. And this is, this is another of boxing's many problems. Like ranking systems should surely be transparent. It should be. There should be. However, they're worked out. There should be. It should be clear. You know, in an ideal world, it would be like a ladder where if you beat the guy above you, you go up to his place. And also, it would make the sort of non-title fights a lot more interesting if they were a, if there was a yeah, clear yeah. path to get to get to a champion. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. No, it does. I mean, particularly the, his last fight um, was against Brian Vera. That was unconvincing, um, and you know, to, it's, it's an unconvincing is probably not big enough a word for his performance there. Um, exactly. And there's so many unprofessional things <laughs> Chavez yeah. Jr. has done. It's just not fair, like not coming in at the way. Or so he could. Okay, we'll move. We'll move back. In fact, now while we're on the subject of the WBC, we'll go back to Frotch and Grove shortly. But also, while I was while well, I noticed that Chavez Jr. had been installed as their super middleweight mandatory with never having fought at the weight, I also noticed that Anthony Joshua was um, three places above David Price in the heavyweight rankings. 
Is that fair? Uh, well, <laughs> well, yeah, no, I don't understand that either. It's no, no criticism to Anthony Joshua. <laughs> he's, I think he's very, very good, but he has only had three fights. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and David Price is, you know, as, as well as his recent couple of losses to Tony Thompson, he's had some good wins on the way as well. So, yeah, no, Price should be, Price should be higher than that. He should be. And also, it's further investigation also showed that Sam Sexton, who Price knocked out in four rounds pretty handily, pretty convincingly, um, in 2012, I believe, is at number 27, 10 places above Price, and incidentally, seven above Joshua. Again, it's the whole, the whole ranking system, and I'm not... You know, so Joshua, Sam Sexton has to happen. Is that what you're telling me? Well, that's what it's the fight the public wants. It's true. You make it a WBC <laughs> eliminator. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, we've met, you know, I'm not singling out the WBC. We've already mentioned the IBF with their treatment of, um, of Lamont Peterson. Uh, the, you know, none of the governing bodies um, have, uh, really do themselves any favours, do they? And, it's, and I know from when I speak to sports fans and, and what have you, it's, 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 it's the politics of the governing bodies that have the most trouble explaining and exactly how it all works and mm. yeah and like we're thinking for next week's issue one of the questions we're yeah. pondering is will box, boxing become a mainstream sport again and i think it's exactly things like this that people don't understand you know why certain fights aren't happening or how this person is ranked so highly what's he done to be there yeah. that kind of thing i think those are the kind of problems that make boxing you know opaque to a, a you know, a, a general casual yeah. sports fan, so you're just going to turn off followers or you're going to make it hard to follow the sport when, you know, even the governing, governing bodies don't seem to know what's going on. Well, exactly. And it's, it's, it's difficult It's difficult for, for, for us to provide the answers. It's been difficult for me in the past to provide the answers that, to the questions that, that, that people have posed to me because it's just completely nonsensical, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so back to... Um, Frotch Groves, Frotch Groves, Chavez. I think we'd both, and I'm, I don't think I'm being overly presumptuous, but I, th I think I'm correct in saying we'd both like to see Frotch Groves as opposed to Frotch Chavez. But can you can you can you see Frotch's Frotch's logic in in going down the Chavez route? To you know, to an extent, because I do I do think the Groves fight should be appealing because it would be it would be so big. Uh, especially in the UK, I'm not quite sure how the numbers would stack up. Whereas Chavez is obviously more appealing in the in the US. Um, but yeah, but Froch's stance is quite an interesting one because he's he's a proud man who doesn't want to be, you know, bounced into anything or 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 you know or push you know push one way or another. Um, so I don't think he likes being dictated to by George Groves. I don't think he likes being told you have to do this. Um, so you can see why someone would want to sort of have their fate in their own hands and make their own calls. Um, but I still think George Grose would be the logical choice of opponent. And I, 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 I wonder if talking about Chavez Jr. and his other options is just, you know, is that a negotiating tactic to make sure he's going, you know, to make sure he's got as many cars as possible going into that, into that discussion? I, d I, d I don't know. No, it's... Um it's an interesting one, yeah. and hopefully we will have some answers. But I mean, but for me, I've got, you know, Froch, Froch Chavez, although it might be, you know, a fairly decent spectacle, it would be, I don't think it'd be a major event com compared to, when you compare it to some of the other fights that, that, that will be held in Las Vegas this year. Um, maybe Froch feels more appreciated on the road, because he's had all those great triumphs. Maybe. Sort of. You know, in the you know on the way to the Super Six final and that kind of stuff overseas, you know maybe he didn't care for being booed at the end of the um, not you know wasn't his fault he didn't stop the fight but no, I don't think absolutely. he liked absolutely. hearing boos in the Manchester Arena so maybe he thinks you'll get more appreciation if he goes if he goes back on the road. No, I agree. I, I no, I, I I agree with that. I just fear that I don't know what what Froch because you know he's saying that he wants challenges and that sort of thing. I can't imagine if he goes out and he beats Julio Cesar Chavez. I can't imagine that really enhances his legacy a great deal. Um, as we were, we touched on earlier, Chavez has never fought at the weight. Um, he had fairly, even though he was unbeaten, a fairly mixed middleweight career. Um, impressed in that last round against Sergio Martinez. 
Um, but but for Froch to be up for a challenge, and I saw him on ringside and he was saying, yeah, you know, I'm not really excited about a Groves rematch. I just, I, I, I like you, I wonder if he's actually telling the truth there because I would have thought that after everything that went on in that first fight, the subsequent criticism he's received, Froch, the warrior, would want to just put all that to one side and the only way you can do that is by going out and knocking George Groves in a rematch yeah I, w- I would have thought a rematch would mean a lot more to him where yeah. he said like, before the first fight until they actually got in the ring you know I'm sure he doesn't didn't take him light, lightly but it yeah. w- it's not the same as that having that you know he wanted to settle the score with Kessler there was a lot on the line against Bute I don't think it had the same you know meaning um, now I think it would mean a lot to him because I think he finds Crows very annoying, yeah. um, and I think he wants to get a, you know a clear a clear result there. And also, I don't think like if, if now the IBF is saying he loses his title with them, I don't think he wants to relinquish his belt either. It no. seems I, I imagine that would be important to him too. Yeah, yeah, you'd think so. You know, you understand the lure of Las Vegas, but the lure, you do, Matt. The lure <laughs> of Julio Cesar Chavez, not quite so much. It's not a bad fight, though. No, I think you'd like to see, you know, Froch give him a lesson in professionalism. But I'd like to see him fight Groves first, and then you know tra- Chavez later. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Okay, I mean, for a lot more on Froch, on the whole Froch and Groves um, situation, editor Tris Dixon. Um, has done quite a interesting um, editor's letter this week where he looks at both sides and, and kind of offers his viewpoint, which is which is really good stuff. You've spoke to George Groves. We've got an, um, an exclusive interview with Groves in there kind of explaining the situation after it came out in a Carl Froch statement that Groves had rejected um, terms for a rematch. Um, okay, so moving on, something else that we've got in this week is is, is an exclusive interview with a former world champion from these shores, Enzo Macronelli, um, who is a big favourite of, of, of us here at, at Boxing News, but we have also been a bit concerned in recent years that, that maybe he's, he's hung around too long. But, but to be fair to him, what he's done in the, last, in the last few months is turn his career around at light heavyweight, two decent wins, admittedly at domestic level, but now he finds himself on the brink of a world title shot against Jürgen Bremer. Is this is is this fairy tale stuff or is this horror movie stuff? <laughs> I think it starts out as fairy tale stuff, but um, I think there's always going to be that unease because you know because you know people people like Enzo, we like Enzo, but we've seen him suffer these nasty knockouts. Brain is a you know a spiteful puncher, and you, you know and you worry you don't want to see someone knocked out knocked out heavily. But you know we've written off. And those chances before, and he's proven us wrong. So, yeah, I suppose you know he's a grown up. He can make his own decisions. Who turned down a world title fight? I mean, I would because <laughs> it, it would really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but he is a professional fighter. So yeah, I suppose if you're going to still be in boxing, you're going to want to fight. You know, fight the highest level you can. But there's that that but is going to remain. I don't think we want to see him suffer another another heavy knockout. No, no. I think I think I, I completely agree with everything you've said there. Ultimately, it is up to Enzo. He has got a series of wins, neither of which against Overall McKenzie or uh, Courtney Fry were worthy for me of of then jumping up to 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 a world light heavyweight title fight, but. You know, it's hard to begrudge him that. It's hard to begrudge him that. So, mm. you know, all we can do is wish Enzo all the best. Moving on to um, events that are just around the corner, and it's the weekend, and I believe you, Health Abiding, are heading off to sunny Cardiff. Exactly. The weekend. If I have to die in my seat, <laughs> I will do. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really, really nice-looking card, topped by Lee Selby against Rendell Monroe. Um, I mean, we, you've... you've You've put together a really good preview in this wow. week's issue, so we Thanks, won't Matt. we won't go too much into your um, into that. We'll let we'll let readers read what your prediction is. But first of all, tell me why Lee Selby can win, and then follow it by telling me why Rendell Munro can win. Uh, Selby's bigger at featherweight. You know he's he's got he, he he's got those skills. He can just keep Munro away from him, pick him apart as he comes forward. 
Munro, however, uh, he has, you know, maybe not featherweight, but he's fought a lot of people who have gone on to be world champions. So that just shows the, you know, and had his own failed bid for a world title. So he's got that extra level of experience. If he if he rediscovers that old the old fire, he can keep rumbling forward, take over in the second half of the fight. That's how he'd do it. Like it. What will actually happen? Well, we'll have to see on Saturday. <laughs> we'll have to see on Saturday. But, you know, it's a nice, it is a nice looking ball. You've got that, which for me is, you make Selby favourite, but, but Munro is, is very much a live underdog. Um, and also, in chief support, you know, similar, a similar contest where you're not quite sure what the outcome is going to be is, is Gavin Reese against Gary Buckland. I think again, that's a great fight. Yeah, that could be, uh, that, that could be absolutely action packed. Again, why can Reese win and why can Buckland win? Uh, you know, Reese, he's been at the high, he, you know, he's been at a higher level. He, you know, he's had a world title at the way above. He's small, but he's fast. Knows how to use his jab. Um, can, you know, can you know get someone in, in those bursts of activity. Buckland is a, you know, is a tough guy. He might see. He, I think he maybe he w- he will be able to shrug off the effects of of that sort of devastating knockout against Stephen Smith. Um, he do, you know, he doesn't take a backward step. He's he can be, you know, he could he could grind Gavin Reese down. Um, yeah. No, it's good. I think I, I think as well. You've just got to say what um what well, what hopefully what a good advertisement this will be for. For British boxing, um, yeah, or Welsh boxing in particular, in this case, yeah, yeah, Welsh boxing, yeah. Um, what else? Anything else on that bill? Oh, Anthony, Anthony jo- Dorian, Dorian Darch will be his toughest test yet. Of, yeah, um, but that's. I think if he if he beats Dorian Darch, I think the WBC should start about thinking banging him in the, uh, <laughs> in the top five. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's a good fight. Darch also has sort of home advantage, which you know. He's Probably won't count for all that much against no. Anthony Joshua, but he's only, you know Joshua's only three fights into his career. He's looked very good so far, but um, but th- there is, regardless of what the WBC say, there's still a long way to go yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so as well. Okay, right. Moving on to probably the last thing we'll discuss this week is the um, kind of the most people's leading middleweight, even though he hasn't perhaps done it on paper as yet, is um, Gennady Golovkin. And, you know, he was one of the most impressive, for me, one of the most impressive fighters of the last two years in world boxing. Well, certainly one of the sport's most fearsome, um, underrated boxing skills. But it's not overly exciting this weekend, is it? No. Um, against the Dharma. Um, what 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 chance the upset? It, I mean, <laughs> nil. <laughs> really that low? I don't. I don't. Know. Anything can happen. Glock might fall over or <laughs> uppercut himself in the face. I don't know. Golovkin doesn't seem like you know someone who's going to slip up on, on this occasion. But you know, is he yet? He, I know you just said he's seen as, as the leading middleweight in the world but to be that wouldn't he have needed to to have beaten a, a Felix Sturm Definitely. a Gill or got in there with Sergio Martinez even though we think he'd, he'd probably be the favourite in those fights because he's you know he's beating people with such style he hasn't got he hasn't really had those, those defining wins yet which I think is why I mean Boxing News didn't have him in our we didn't have him in we didn't have him in, have him in our top ten fighters of, of twenty thirteen. No. And I think that's probably why, even though yeah. he's been even though he's looked so good doing what he's had to do, he hasn't had the sort of you know, his best win so far has been against Matthew Macklin, which is, you know, which was hugely impressive. Um, but Macklin wasn't like a former champion or a current champion. Yeah, absolutely. And incidentally, um we were kind of um you know, picking holes in governing body rankings and what have you. We um, have Sergio Martinez, quite rightly still, as middleweight champion. But I think what, what I was kind of getting at earlier is that I think if you were to pitch the leading middleweights together in a tournament, I think the majority of experts would pick Golovkin. 
to be last man standing. Yeah. But yeah, he still has actually got to, to prove that. But I don't think Adama is the opponent to do that. If you do get Boxing News this week, and of course we advise it, you can get it from news agents or you can download it. Um, it's a really good feature from the always impressive Dol McRae on, um, on Gennady Glovkin. That's interesting reading. Um, great amateur section this week. Great amateur section this week. Um, which is, oh, amateurs edited by John Denon. Well, Turn over the page, vested interest, meet the personalities at the heart of the sport with John Denon. How can you say no to that? <laughs> I'm not, mate. I'm not saying no, I'm saying yes. <laughs> I'm saying yes. Good boxing news active as well. Yeah, very good. Very good. Being active. Um, John Denon. Mm, good stuff, <laughs> Okay, right, I think that'll about do it for this week, but we'll be back next week with more opening bell and... Thanks, everybody, for listening. <sighs> it oh, I think that's going to be my thing. So, and hello, John. It oh, no? watch us wreck the mic. <laughs> are we? Are we on? Is this thing on? Oh. Tough crowd. Just checking it's on. Thank you for watching and listening, and remember to subscribe to us on YouTube. Hit the like button on Facebook. Comment or write a review on iTunes or Google Play. It only takes a minute, and it does loads to help us produce shows like these.